Good evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. My guest tonight is the man who interrogated the deposed President Saddam Hussein of Iraq after he was captured. Um, he, uh, John Nixon is in Washington, D.C. Welcome, John. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, the first thing you had to do when you interrogated him for the CIA was to ask, to work out how to identify him. How did you identify him uh, for your superiors? Well, one of the things that I was uh, asked, yeah, as you said, I was asked to identify him. Uh, I looked for um, a bullet wound that I knew that he had. He, I knew he had a scar on his leg from a bullet wound. Uh, I also knew of the tribal markings that he had on his hand and wrist. And uh, he also um, had certain physical features that I thought would be of interest. One was that, you know, his lip kind of drooped a little bit from a lifetime of smoking cigars. And, uh, you know, um, and I also had a list of about 40 questions that I felt only Saddam really could be the one who knows this. So only Saddam or maybe one or two other people would know the answer to these questions. And, so, uh, And, of I course, you, you've been studying him for the... Uh, I, I, you, you'd been uh, uh, studying him for quite a while, and so you knew what yes. to look for. Um, but it must have been fascinating, after all that time, finally getting in to be with him. What was he like? Uh, you know, it, it, he, he was everything I kind of expected and more. And yet, he was also a surprising at times. He was sort of a jumble of contradictions. He, was, uh, he could be incredibly charming, uh, witty. Um, nice, polite, self-deprecating, but at other times he could be really kind of nasty and mean-spirited and uh, vulgar and crude and, and really a little frightening at times. But what was really important is to understand how he was different from the public expectations. I mean, you, you had already uh, tried to debunk without complete success uh, the common uh, view that he had body double. <laughs> yeah, I get asked that question. I still get asked that question. Yeah, whether or not he had, to. Um, and you know, it, it was one of the. Mo there were a lot of very persistent myths about Saddam Hussein, some of which he helped propagate because it added to his aura of leadership. Right. right. But uh, uh, you know, he, it's uh, uh, the, the body double thing was uh, was actually pretty funny. One time we were talking about it, and uh, he just he got tired of the questions, and he said. He just said, you know, what makes you think uh, I'm not a body double and the real Saddam Hussein is out there running around free? And I said, and then he just sort of laughed, shook his head and laughed. And he said, no, of course not. There's, a, there's only one Saddam Hussein. But in fact, even before you met him, you knew there were no body doubles. And, and, you, briefed, and you briefed the leadership. But even after that, uh, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld spoke and, and in fact wrote about the body doubles. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, it was, it was uh, one of these... Uh, as I said, it's one of these myths that we ha constantly had to keep answering and telling people that, th and the more we told people that they didn't exist, the more people had questions about them. And I, it's one of these weird Washington dynamics that people, you know, they want, they'll believe what they want to believe. And, and nothing is truer about the Iraq war than people believing what they want to believe. Right. But of course, on the more serious level, there were a lot of issues you wanted to look at. For instance, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, yes. You, before the war, you, you, you voted for uh, President George W. Bush. Uh, you believed there were weapons of mass destruction before, you, uh, before, you, uh, 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 before the war. Uh, but afterwards, of course, it was clear there weren't any, and Saddam Hussein confirmed that. Yes. Yes. We had, we had extensive discussions about that. And, you know, one of the problems, one of the, the difficulties in, in uh, talking to Saddam was that he was such a suspicious and, and uh, you know, such a suspicious person and, and so secretive. And it was hard to understand. It was hard to figure out when he was lying and when he was telling the truth. And even when he was telling the truth, you would walk away feeling, well, something's not right. He, he, he seems to be holding back or maybe he was lying to me. But a lot of times what would happen would be I would go and check the record or I would go back and do some research and I would find that, yeah, he is in fact telling the truth. So you believed there were weapons of mass destruction, but we now know that even the intelligence available at that time was pretty sloppy. Um, did, did you, 
was there a, was there any real when you look back on it now was there a real strong reason to believe there were still weapons of mass destruction well you know i wasn't a weapons expert and i i uh, kind of went along with what the uh what the people who like military uh, analysts cia yeah. uh were saying uh and because i sit in on a lot of the briefings that they gave and we talked about uh in almost every briefing that we 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 gave to anyone uh weapons of mass destruction was always a major topic and I, uh, there seemed to be fairly compelling evidence um, at the time that just turned out to be complete bunk. Now, there's a lot that's been made of uh, some of the uh, assertions that were made through a, a, a source called Curveball. And I think even um, not everybody at CIA was, was buying into that. But there was, there was other evidence that seemed to make a compelling case at the time. Uh, and, you know, um, it, it just was, it turned out to be uh, just something. Uh, and if I can make this point also, uh, so much of what we looked at, when we looked at Saddam, so much of what we thought about him had been created in the, in the, with the information that we got in the 80s and the 90s. And, you know, um, I, I think that nobody, I never heard anybody ever once question whether or not he was looking to get weapons of mass destruction. And even though it, this was out there in the, in the news media and that there were people out there saying that he didn't have them, um, you know, the evidence that we were seeing in intelligence circles was, was completely different. And we now and, know that a lot of that was uh, coming from suspect sources who had, who had a vested interest. We have to take a break. We'll be right back. And we're back talking to John Nixon, the man who interrogated Saddam Hussein. Uh, John, uh, from my research into intelligence services and what they find, it's often difficult to get the truth or to be sure of the truth. And intelligence agencies often get, them get, the get things wrong. But in this yes. case, it just so happens that South Africa's intelligence, uh, you and I have discussed this uh, uh, prior to the show, South Africa's intelligence had worked with the uh, Saddam Hussein government in the apartheid era, pre-democracy, and the president of South Africa reconstituted that group, sent them to Iraq uh, with the blessing of Saddam Hussein and uh, with the full knowledge of the US and UK and access to all the intelligence. And they came back absolutely satisfied they weren't there. And President Mbeki informed President Bush, as well as uh, US intelligence, and had a long meeting with Tony Blair in um, in, at Chequers at the British Prime Minister's country estate, um, spelling out chapter and verse about why it didn't exist anymore. Uh, you never, n none of that ever got to you, uh, to people in the intelligence services in the US that you know of? No, not that I know of, no. You, no know, I, I, you know, this was, this was something that uh, certainly by 2001, you know, the, the end game had already been put in place for Saddam with the U.S. government. Um, and, you know, I look back now on things like UNSCOM and the UNSCOM inspectors and, uh, and Charles Dulfer's role in all of that. And uh, I'm, I'm now very suspicious of what exactly they were doing and what certainly Saddam was. One of the reasons, one of the big questions I always get is, why didn't he just declare, show them that he didn't have these things? Yes. And, and the thing is, you know, um, uh, UNSCOM was, was filled with intelligence officers from a variety of different agencies uh, from different countries. And from Saddam's vantage point, these people are not here to, to find out about weapons. They're, they're here to kind of map out his regime, find regime vulnerabilities, report back so that they, you know, those other countries can then come and take him out. So, so just to be clear, the UN had people going in to look for weapons of mass destruction uh, but they were infiltrated by American agents, and Saddam knew that, so he didn't trust them. Right. And um, now the next question, of course, is about 9-11. Uh, yeah. uh, Rumsfeld and others, uh, Dick Cheney, the vice president of the U.S., kept saying that there was an association between Saddam and 9-11. Uh, when you asked Saddam about that, he laughed. Yeah, he, you know, he, he just, he couldn't believe, first of all, he, he couldn't believe that, you know, he, why he, he said, who was involved 
in 9-11. He says that they were Saudis, there was an Egyptian, there was an Emirati. Uh, it's like, well, those are your friends. There yeah. were no Iraqis involved. Why do you right. think that I had anything to do with it? Yeah. And w when I, we talked about it some more, I said, what was your reaction when you first heard about that? And he said, well, I was relieved. He said, I was relieved because uh, now the United States would see that Iraq has nothing, does not threaten it, the United States. Iraq has nothing to do with 9-11. And in fact, the enemies that just hit the United States were his enemies as well. And he thought they'll now, they'll now come to their senses and realize that Iraq is, could be an ally in this. In, in this other fight. words, after 9-11, he thought that was in effect a breakthrough for, for him in his relationship with yeah. Washington. Yeah, and, and the thing is, uh, he couldn't have been more wrong because the Bush administration on 9-12 was looking for the linkages to connect him, Saddam, to 9-11. Exactly. In fact, the very next day, uh, Paul Wolfowitz was tasking the CIA and saying, uh, tell me how many times Saddam has publicly threatened the United States. What was the answer? Uh, the answer is that he never, he never publicly threatened the United States. Yeah. Um, and and uh, uh, um, and and so, but I, I mean, I think it's also. I mean, you, you explain a lot about uh, Saddam Hussein. First of all, of course, uh, people in the U.S. government and in other governments have said he was crazy. Now, I must say, I always find when analysts talk about any polit um, national leader as crazy, it's to me, it's a very unsatisfactory an, uh, assessment. It, it's a lazy assessment. And and in his case, you don't believe it. No, not at all. I thought he was quite sane. Certainly his methods were, you know, could be barbaric and ruthless. Um, and, you know, that we don't approve, I don't approve of them. Uh, but of insane, crazy? First, well, a, a, I'm not a psychiatrist or a psychologist, so I'm not qualified to make that assessment, so I wouldn't. And number two, um, he was quite sane, I thought, in, in terms of, just from in layman's terms. Uh, your, he seemed to be in full. Your, full assess your assessment uh, from him, of him, from as I've read it in the book, you regarded him as intelligent but unsophisticated, and someone yes. who really was a product of his own society. Yes, very, very much so. He was. I think the phrase I would use to describe him was street smart. Yeah. He, he really was clever, and he had he had mastered the ways of staying in control right. and making right. sure that nobody ever got the better of him. However, ruthlessly. Right, exactly. But but the thing is, he when it came to understanding other countries and the international system, and certainly when it came to understanding the United States, Saddam was out of his depth, definitely. And of course, to understand the U.S. from his point of view, I mean, it's easy for us to uh, see it from outside, but from his point of view, it was very difficult because uh, he was allied with the U.S. in the Reagan era, in the Iran, Iraq war. Uh, then suddenly George Bush, uh, uh, Reagan's vice president, becomes president, the first George Bush, and he then wages war uh, on Iraq over Kuwait. Yes, uh, and you know, if you look at that, you know, uh, beginning with, say, the early 1980s, Iraq is an enemy. Then Iraq starts to be brought into the fold by Washington, and there seems to be a warming of relations and an establishment of diplomatic posts. Then you have Iran-Contra, which is a really big development where that, I mean, sends Saddam over the edge, where he really begins to distrust the United States. Because the United then, States is dealing with Iran, his mortal enemy, uh, in right. secret. And Iran also, one of, the, one of the things that Iran sort of demands of the United States is help in overthrowing Saddam Hussein. And that's in the Iran-Contra report. Uh, now, then you get, then all of a sudden you get to this point where in the late 80s, things seem to be get, improving again. And it's really a, a very inconsistent United States that is dealing with Saddam. And he, he's not a sophisticated observer of world, of world affairs. And I think he was very confused. And certainly when he talked to us, he, he, he said as much. He said, I always found the United States very confusing because they seemed to want to have a relationship. Then sometimes they didn't. Then, you know, and then certainly by if, if and about the invasion of Kuwait, which was a very fascinating part of our discussion. I've always felt that one of the thing, reasons why Saddam went into Kuwait, um, aside from the immediate re reasons, which were mostly economic, um, was because of the signals that Washington, the mixed signals that Washington sent. I mean, Washington, at the time, to be fair to the Bush administration, was very much concerned with a number of very, very important things, like the uh, implosion of uh, communism, uh, the, the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, fall of the Soviet Union, 
uh, the reunification of Germany, uh, Tiananmen Square, all these things happened in the first two years of the Bush administration. And I don't think that the Bush administration really had their eye on, uh, and certainly the, the agency didn't help much because the agency has basically told the Bush administration that um, their assessment of Iraq was that Iraq will go into a period of rebuilding and that it will lick its wounds and try to rebuild its society after the Iran-Iraq war and that they would not threaten anybody for the foreseeable future. We have to take a break. We'll be right back with John Nixon. We're back with John Nixon, the man who interrogated uh, President Saddam Hussein of Iraq. Um, John, you uh, uh, um, came out of this experience rather, you, you, uh, rather um, disturbed. Uh, you had several briefings in the Oval Office which you, when you briefed President George W. Bush, the man you had voted for. How was that? Uh, um, how many hours do we have to, <laughs> it was, it was sort of like talking to Saddam Hussein. Um, the, uh, he was, um, he was, first of all, when I first saw him in, in 2008, I, I'd originally seen him in 2001, right after he, the election was decided in January of 2001. And I couldn't get over how much, but this happens, how much he had aged. And I know this is a natural process sure, of sure. what happened to the presidents, but, um, you know, he was somebody who really wanted input, and he loved to get input that was good news, and he loved to get input that sort of correlated with what he already thought. But the minute you kind of gave him something that was surprising to him or that contradicted something that he may have heard from somebody else, he kind of got confused, and then he would sort of fall back into this, this I'm, a, I'm a gut player, and I go by my gut. And uh, that's fine, but as, as, well, as long as your gut playing instincts are good, and his gut playing instincts I thought were very bad. Your, your sense of uh, George W. Bush was that he was more intelligent than the, the uh, sort of caricature of him, uh, but, that, but that, as you say, he, he, uh, he, he didn't like to be contradictory. He, didn't, he wasn't necessarily open to new information. No, no, no. In fact, he liked agreement more than anything. Um, you know, we can look at uh, the things that presidents like and admire. You know, you look at President Trump and he seems to like loyalty, you know, yeah. and, uh, um, and and success. Those are, I think, the two things that Trump really likes. Right. Uh, Bush, it like prizes agreement and consensus. Yeah. And, uh, and when somebody comes in to the Oval Office and breaks that consensus, it was a really fascinating thing to watch because I was there with his entire national security team and I told him something that he didn't expect to hear that he didn't agree with. And in the process of debating this, they all sort of circled around Bush and began just challenging me and like trying to knock me down and in a way sort of looked like they were protecting the president and also kind of showing how loyal they were to him. And they must have had a sense that they were going beyond facts rather than Oh, yeah, yeah. Them. Well, the funny thing is, is that at the end of the session, I, I mean, I, I got out of there, I, I felt shell-shocked after this, <laughs> uh, you know, I was in there for half an hour, and I just was getting question after question after question, and, and they were kind of nasty at times, all questioning my, my sort of my analytic integrity at times, yeah. and, uh, but then at the end of it, when they're all walking out, and, and I'm, I'm waiting for the briefer to come out, uh, they, a lot of them came by and thanked me for, for coming, and thanked me you know, I shook my hand, and, and apparently I had said the things that uh, I think probably needed to be said, but nobody in the room was going to be willing to say it and um, jeopardize their position with the president. Now, um, you referred in your book, uh, that the whole story of your conversation with in the Oval Office is in the book, but you also referred to a, a book which I've also read called Lessons in Disaster by Gordon Goldstein. I went to interview uh, Gordon uh, in his office in New York. He wrote about how... America got Vietnam wrong. And so you found this an important book, and I know the Obama people read it. But there seems to be a pattern here. After getting Vietnam wrong and people writing books like this about it, uh, Iraq happens and we get it wrong again. And it looks like there's no reason to think that won't happen over and over. Uh, of course, uh, largely because Americans, uh, I think, are very unsophisticated in, in understanding the outside world. They, they ha have really no, no 
no interest and and take no time to kind of educate themselves. And our government is uh, unfortunately it's kind of recreating the wheel constantly. I but thought not- that. I thought after Vietnam we would never experiencing experiencing anything like that again, and yet in 2003 through 2009 it was it was very much like Vietnam. But if you went into the Oval Office and used the the dreaded V word, you were summarily kicked out, you know. And that's what happens. And I couldn't get over how 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 historically illiterate some of the people in government were, and particularly yeah. some people in the Bush administration. But this is true about a lot of administrations. But just and they all ju- think. Sorry, they before we go, I want to just, uh, we're running out of time, I want to go through a couple more things, but quickly sure. on the Middle East. Um, I uh, was in Washington as a journalist when the first Gulf War, uh, Iraq War, broke out, and I interviewed people close to the then, uh, the first Bush administration, who were very firm. They thought that um, um, getting rid of Saddam Hussein, which of course they didn't do in the end at that time, but getting rid of Saddam Hussein would have the effect of a kind of domino effect throughout the Middle East, and and governments then would become more pro-Western, pro-US, and even less unsympathetic to Israel. And so I think Rumsfeld and those people, they came back into into office under George W. Bush uh, with that view. So part of it was not just that they didn't understand Iraq, but they consciously believed that a, a, a war in Iraq, getting rid of Saddam, would be good for the West, and, and, and the rest of the Arab states would get better from their point of view. Yeah, uh, again, um, but the result has been the, the exactly. entire opposite. Yeah, so one, I mean, obviously it's very hard to, uh, to make counterfactual history, but it, it certainly things have got worse, and it's hard to believe that the war, the war hasn't been a negative influence on the whole region. So I, I can't see anything positive coming out of the war, you know, and a lot of a lot of what we said at, this, at the agency, I think, you know, we, when we were asked about, you know, what, what's like the, the few times we were asked about what happens on the day after, you know, we kind of gave a very, very negative assessment. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe that we fully understood just how bad the situation would become throughout the region. Yeah. Um, well, there are, uh, there are people who have said that George Bush, when he, when he started the war, did not know that there were Sunnis, Shiites, and Kurds uh, in the Iraq dividing it up. I don't know if you had any view about that. Oh, yeah. No, he, uh, he, he I, I think I have it in the book. Uh, he, he had a meeting, where, and uh, he was being told about, um, gosh, I can't remember. He was being told about um, uh, the Sunni-Shia split. And he said, I, I thought you said they were all Muslim. And that was kind of his response. I, I'm, af- uh, I'm, afraid we, oh. sorry. I'm afraid we have to end it there, John. Thanks so much for doing this. Uh, the book is Debriefing the President, the Interrogation of Saddam Hussein. I strongly recommend it. It reads like a thriller. Uh, thanks for doing this, John. Uh, good night. And, uh, oh, thank you. My, my pleasure.